Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Cody Miller Show. This is the ultimate swimming related show where we talk about all things floating through the world of swimming. That's news stories, breaking stories, current events, racing, training, tips, tricks, whatever you, the audience, wants to talk about, that's what I am here for. And guys, we have a lot of great stuff to talk about today. Got a, a great show lined up for you right now. Questions submitted by you all that we're gonna get to, but first, I've gotta tell you, I hope you all are having a good Monday morning. Hopefully your week is off to a great start. I had a rocky uh, week last week. Had a great weekend, um, but a rocky week, first of all. When they told me that having children was gonna take a toll on you in a way you never expected, that has never become more true than right now. This is now the third time where I have caught a sickness that has come from my daycare. It's like a cesspool. It's like a breeding ground for gross bacteria. I mean, my brother-in-law got sick the previous weekend, stomach bug that he definitely got from daycare, and we joked about it, and then sure enough, I got it couple days later. So basically from Tuesday till Thursday, I was just totally bedridden, couldn't get out of bed, throwing up, all the nasty, you know, bowel movement stuff. And I'm obviously fine now, totally good now. But then right when I started getting better, then Allie caught it and Allie was bedridden for a day. And then she trucked along and, and actually made it to work the next day. So um, yeah, dang it, Axel. Axel just getting me sick. I mean, I threw up in a parking lot. Like it, it was a little rocky. So I had I had a rough week, but um, good weekend traveling out to, you know, uh, do a bunch of USA Swimming Symposium stuff, did some swim clinics, lots of fun stuff. So that's all great. But now we're here starting off the week stronger, trying to get back to my, my morning swims. Um, lots of fun racing that I've got coming up. You know, I'm swimming in the, the IU Quadrathlon, gonna do a little bit of racing. Um, so a lot of fun stuff's been happening, but man, I've, I've, had a, I've had a rough go lately. I've been trying to get back to regular training to the best of my abilities, given everything else that I'm trying to juggle. But it's, but it's honestly, it's been a bit of a challenge. It's been a bit of a challenge, um, but we're good now. So I think this week, gonna be strong, gonna be good. But let's start this week off with a great show for you all. So first of all, how do I come up with the main topics of the show? It's really easy. You all submit the questions. You create the topics. Whenever you come across a topic, a subject, a question that you want me to answer on this show, just fire me an email to the Cody Miller Show at gmail.com. That's Cody Miller Show at gmail.com. And you could possibly see your question or topic answered here on my show. And with that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into our main topics. We've got some good stuff today. And our first main topic of the day comes to us from Josh from New Jersey. And Josh writes, Greetings, Cody. I just saw that USA Swimming announced the date and categories for the 2022 Golden Goggle Awards. I love swimming, but I don't know anything about this event. Can you give us some insight? I was thinking about going, but saw that a single seat cost $2,000. Why on earth is it so expensive? I hope to hear your thoughts. Thanks. All right, Josh. Yeah, I mean, being from New Jersey, you're pretty close to where the event is being held. Um, the event is being held at the Marriott downtown New York City once again. Every year they alternate, you know, usually goes LA, New York, LA, New York. I've been to a few of these. And yes, let's go ahead and get into this. So first of all, $2,000 seat ticket, not cheap. Uh, why is it so expensive? Well, to answer that, the USA Swimming Golden Goggles event is an award ceremony that they put on every single year, and it's basically a big fundraiser. Every single year, they invite all of the athletes from Team USA that made whatever the big premier meet of the year is. So maybe it's the Olympic Games during an Olympic year. In an off year, it's a World Championships. In a year where there's no World Championships, maybe it's the Pan Pacific Championships. Whatever the biggest meet is, they take those team members, they invite them to a ceremony, and they create all these categories, and it's a big fundraiser, okay? That's why it's so expensive, and I've got I wanted to refresh my memory because I remember looking at this thinking it was absurd years and years ago when I got invited to my first Golden Goggles. I looked at what some of the tickets were and I was shocked at how expensive it was and I didn't know why. So when I read this question, I was like, okay, we can get into this. A single seat, $2,000. A bronze table, that's eight seats. A bronze level table, that's $15,000. A silver table is $25,000. 
and a gold level table cost $50,000 for eight seats. And there's a few other benefits to that. You get to request the athlete that you wanna sit with. So if you wanna to go to the Golden Goggles Awards and sit at a table with some of your family members and friends next to Caleb Dressel or Katie Ledecky or whoever your big star of choice is, you would get to choose if you can drop the 50K. Um, this event also fundraises through auctioning off certain items. So a lot of the times during an Olympic year at US Olympic swimming trials, they have these really cool seats for the officials to sit at behind the, the blocks on both sides of the pool. And there are these nice cushion seats that have like the USA Swimming logo along with the Olympic trials logo and they're, they're really cool. And um, I believe every coach that puts an athlete on the US Olympic team gets one of those chairs which is pretty cool, Ray has a couple of them. Um, but the remaining chairs get auctioned off at events like this. They also auction off flags like that with all of the signatures of the Olympians. And all of this money from all of these different items, those are just a few of them, goes into a pool that then funds the United States National Swim Team. So the United States National Swim Team, all of the benefits of being on that team, which we're gonna talk about, in a little bit on an upcoming topic, but all of the things that go into being on the United States national team, everything that pays for that pretty much comes from donations and events like this. Now, USA Swimming is a nonprofit organization, nonprofit, however, they do, they do turn a bit of a profit and so some money gets funneled into the national team department, but the reason that this event, the Golden Goggles Awards exists is to help United States national team swimmers. It's to help promote people's journey to hopefully making a world championship team, to hopefully making an Olympic team, to winning medals, to all of those types of things. And that is why it's so expensive. And um, just like looking briefly at the awards, maybe as we get closer, I'll do a segment where we talk about what the award categories are. I don't really put any, any stock into this because I just don't really care that much because this is, it's an award ceremony that's voted on by the public. So if you have a favorite athlete of yours that you think should win Breakout Performer of the Year or the Perseverance Awards, you can go ahead and go on the USA Swimming website and vote for your favorite athlete. Um, but to me, it's like, what does the public think about these athletes? It's, it's, a, it's a cool thing. I don't really think very many people vote. I don't really think a whole lot of people pay attention to it. It's, it's a nice thing. Um, the more important thing is that we're, we're funding and taking care of, our, all, of all of our athletes. I more care about the the performances that they did that got them to this award ceremony, you know, like at Worlds, at the Olympics, at Pan American Games, those types of things. But I mean, they've got events like, or not events, they have categories like Breakout Performer of the Year. You know, you've got Carson Foster listed, Tori Husk, uh, Perseverance Award, uh, Coach of the Year. Uh, my club coach, Ron Aiken, is nominated this year for the Sandpipers. Relay Performance of the Year, Female Race of the Year. So. Maybe we'll talk more about these in the future, but that's kind of it. It's just it's just an award show. They have a red carpet. All the athletes get all dolled up, dressed up. And um, I remember being like really nervous and like not really sure what to expect. My first gold, Golden Goggles like over 10 years ago. And then I quickly realized like, oh, like I'm here to put on a good face and basically meet donors and basically shake hands and meet people that have the means to help make these dreams possible, to help fundraise. Cause that stuff, it's just important. Like that stuff is important. Like where that stuff goes, it really, really matters. So I don't want to like crap talk the golden goggles all that much. It's just the outcome of the ceremony. I don't, I don't care about Like I really could care less about it. It really means nothing. Like what the public thinks of these kinds of things to me, but I think that it's great that they do it. Um, and once again, the most important thing is it's funding the U.S. national team. It's helping people achieve their dreams. And that I am absolutely all in favor for. So yes, if you're in the New York City area, it's a short drive. If you've got the means and you want to meet some of your athletes, um, it's a way to, your favorite athletes, it's a way to do that. But that is essentially it. That is the Golden Goggles Awards wrapped into, I don't even, I don't even think it's live streamed. It might be. USA Swimming has done a very good job the last couple years in upping their live stream game, their availability and the, the accessibility to watching certain events online, which is good. Uh, I don't even know if it's live streamed. Um, but yeah, anyways, that's it. Uh, thank you, Josh, for that question. And now let's go ahead and move on to topic number two. And topic number two today comes to us from Cynthia from Jamaica. And Cynthia writes, what's up, Cody? As always, thank you for the amazing swimming content. 
My question is about Team USA. I saw USA Swimming just released the roster for the 2022-2023 national team, and there's like 100 athletes listed. How is this even possible? As a non-revenue generating sport, three out of the four years, how can USA Swimming afford to pay that many athletes? How do athletes make this team? Can you give us some insight into how this stuff works? You rock. Okay, thank you, Cynthia, for that question. And yes, uh, Team USA, USA Swimming just announced their roster, and I believe there's 99 athletes on the United States national team. And your question, uh, how can USA Swimming even afford something like this? Well, really the simple answer is, it's not that expensive because national team members don't get paid a salary. Let me explain something to you. Um, in order to make salary for USA Swimming as an athlete, you have to qualify for something called athlete partnership agreement. There's a whole nother thing. It's completely, completely based on your world ranking. And maybe I'll do a video segment on that in the future, but getting paid and making a salary as a national team athlete doesn't exist. As a national team athlete, essentially there are perks that I'll get into, but first, how do you qualify? To qualify for the United States national team, it's easy. Well, it's not easy to make, but it's pretty easy. You have to be top six in any Olympic event in the long course format in the country. So from January 1 to August 31st of every calendar year, that's roughly the dates, it's about an eight month qualifying period. If you swim a time, that qualifies top, top six out of all of the Americans in the United States, you qualify for the United States national team. Top six in every single Olympic event. And there are benefits to qualifying for the national team. You don't make a salary, as I said, most national team members are broke, I was broke, um, but there are a few benefits. First of all, you do get access to some monthly stipends. Now, mostly that is grants. So there are grants that are, that are basically funded through fundraisers that are funded from personal donors where they say, hey, apply for this grant, um, write uh, an essay about yourself, what your dreams are, what you hope to accomplish, what is your roadmap to getting there, and you might, you might win this grant. I remember early in my collegiate career, I, I made the national team. I think I was like fifth in the country by no means a favorite to ever make an Olympic team, but you know, I was a hopeful and I, I applied for a United States grant that was afforded to me because I was on the national team and I think I got like $7,000. And so that $7,000 was a huge help to me as a very broke college athlete. Like that helped me pay rent, helped me buy food, really helped me a lot. So as a national team member, you get access to grants. You also get some meat reimbursement and there is a hierarchy of that. Um, essentially, if you go to a United States uh, Swimming Pro Series event, like the one that they do in Indy, the one that they do in Mission Viejo, or all over the country, um, they give you a travel reimbursement. So it's like 800 bucks for your travel. Okay, cool, that pays for your plane ticket, as long as plane tickets aren't like ludicrously expensive like they are right now. And um, a lot of times the amount of money that you receive for your reimbursement is dependent on your ranking. So there's like a hierarchy to that as well. Um, you also have access to the athlete health insurance, which is provided by the United States Olympic Committee, or the, yeah, the United States Olympic team provides athletes that level of insurance. Now that I actually think is the most beneficial thing for all of the athletes, because although most of these national team, team athletes are younger and are probably on their parents' insurance plan, as an older athlete, like I once was on the United States team, that was a big help because that insurance is actually huge. It's really, really good. Um, and then finally you get uh, Olympic, tra uh, Olympic Training Center access. So there's a couple Olympic Training Centers in the United States, the big one being located at, at, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is where the USA Swimming headquarters is. And I believe, I could be wrong about this, but I believe you get like two free trips there a year. Like they, they'll pay for you to come out and train there for a period of time, which is also super helpful for a lot of athletes to have that fun experience of going to the training center, going and seeing where all these amazing Olympians have trained. Um, you know, it's, it's a high altitude location. It's about 6,500 feet. Um, and swimming at altitude when you're not used to it is very, very difficult. So the, the benefits of being on the United States team, once again, I'll recap. Access to monthly stipends meat reimbursement, health insurance, 
and you also get trips to the training center. And there are some other things as well, but those are like the main things. Um, you, you don't get a salary, um, but you know, USA Swimming pays for all of those things from the money that they bring in, but also from places like the Golden Goggles Awards, like private donations, um, and, and other things as well. So I hope that that answers your question. Hope that clarifies some things for some people out there so that, hey, if you want to be a professional swimmer, if you're on the path to trying to make an Olympic team someday, if you're a young hopeful, now you know. Like, you, And all this is available online. You can look it up, but now you know. So thank you so much, Cynthia from Jamaica, for that question. Very, very cool. And now let's move on to topic number three. And topic number three today comes to us from Christopher from an undisclosed location. And Christopher writes, Caleb Dressel just explained to the world that he needed to take care of himself after having pulled out of world championships early. The whole United States audience loves him so much and sees him as the greatest of the moment. I see a chance to make a comparison here to the Olympic gymnast Simone Biles. Whereas Simone was dragged through the mud by the media for pulling out of the Olympics and needed to take care of herself, Caleb was not. Caleb was not called a quitter or treated so ferociously. Why do you think that this is? Is there a way to show our heroes love and respect and still hold them on such a high pedestal? I hope you feel like discussing this intelligently. Thanks. Okay, Christian, thank you for that question. And I love how you phrased that. Is there a way to hold our to hold our heroes with such high accountability, you know, on that pedestal, but still with respect? Like that's so let's go ahead and get into this. First of all, the Simone Biles situation that happened at the Tokyo Olympics. As a refresher, Simone Biles is essentially the Michael Phelps of the gymnastics world. She's the most decorated gymnast of all time. From 2013 up until 2019, she never lost an all-around world championship in all of the events. So all of the different events that they perform at gymnastics, you know, the four or the five of them, she won all of them all around, as well as the majority of all of the other events. She basically just dominated. Um, she won numerous Olympic golds at the previous Rio Olympics, and she is basically perceived as the greatest gymnast of all time. And then... At the Tokyo Olympics, she pulled out of the all-around competition, which is where, where all the gymnasts are scored together to try and win a team competition. She pulled out of that for mental health reasons. And at the time, my perception is that the majority of the media outlets that, that reported on this situation in real time, and even shortly after the fact, the majority of it saw it in a negative light. She kind of got dragged through the mud. A lot of people praised her and a lot of people said nice things about her, like Team Simone versus how could you possibly do this? You know, uh, be your true self, it's fine, everything's okay. Or how the heck could you be our hero after winning all these and just pull out? You know, like the two sides. I think when it happened, there was a lot more negativity than positivity about the situation. Regardless of how you feel about it, that's how I perceived it, okay? The Caleb situation was a little bit different. And we're gonna get into that, um, but but first of all, I just I really want to highlight like how insane um, Simone S the Simone thing was. Um, she pulls out of this event, and then the all-around women's team doesn't win the gold medal. The United States doesn't win the gold medal when I believe they were favored to win the gold medal. They end up winning silver, and then after the fact, after pulling out, she comes back and then wins the bronze medal in the balance beam. Okay, so she 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 was able to kind of come back, which was which was great, and people felt conflicted about that. A lot of people saw that as, okay, you you weren't okay to compete, now you are okay to compete, and you're good enough to compete and still win a medal. Um, I have four reasons why the Simone situation is different from the Caleb Dressel situation, and the Caleb Dressel situation is something that we talked about on last week's show about how Caleb went to World Championships this summer won a gold medal on the 4x100 freestyle relay, a very respectable time, won a gold medal in the 50 butterfly individually, was swimming lights out fast, and then left the meet and with on radio silence. And then months passed and he finally came out and said he just, he needed a break. Like he he, he didn't, didn't wanna be there, he was out of it. I have four reasons why I don't think 
these, this is an apples to apples comparison, and then we can talk about it, okay? Reason number one, world championships is not the Olympics. The expectations leading into the world championships by the public versus the expectations of the Olympics for Simone were very, very different. You know, you say the name Simone Biles and people remember what happened at the Tokyo Olympics. People remember what happened at the 2016 Olympics. If you were to ask the general public, 99% of people, what happened at the 2019 Gymnastics World Championships? Nobody knows. What happened at the 2015 Gymnastics World Championships? Nobody knows. Because unless you're living in that world, unless you're in that bubble and you're in the gymnastics world and that's your thing, people don't follow it. And therefore, people don't really care. And the same is true for swimming. You know, in our swimming world, we know Caleb as being the greatest of the time right now, especially leading into the Tokyo Olympics. But if you ask people outside of our bubble, what happened at the 2019 World Championships? 99% of people don't know. What happened at the 2015 World Championships before the Rio Olympics? Nobody really knows. That's just the reality. And so the expectations and the thoughts of the general public are different because they're different events. You've got World Championships, which we ha hold in high regard because it is the biggest event outside of the Olympics, but most people just don't care about it. That's just the reality. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's just the reality. And then you have the Olympics. So the two situations, Simone pulling out of the Olympics versus Caleb pulling out of World Championships, it's not an even comparison because they're not on the same pedestal. And that is why you didn't see the same amount of publicity, the same amount of discussion online, the same amount of write-ups and videos being made about the Caleb Dressel situation because most people just don't care about the Swimming World Championships. That's, I care, I watch all of it. Obviously, people who watch the show care, but that's just the reality of the situation. And so there's, there's, there's that. There's also a factor of, it was stated that Simone pulled out for mental health reasons. It was also stated by Caleb that he pulled out for mental health reasons because he just felt like he didn't, you know, he couldn't be there. There's also another factor involved. There's a safety factor. Simone pulled out of events that could genuinely put her physical safety in harm's way. It's one thing to tell an athlete, a swimmer, oh, you don't feel good, your, your brain is a little soft, like you're not feeling great, toughen up, dive in the pool, swim. All right, like that's maybe not the best thing to say to someone, but like mentally speaking, you're not physically gonna hurt someone, okay? Gymnastics is different. You're gonna tell an athlete, oh, you're not feeling great? Well, I need you to run full speed at a solid object, spring off of a board, fly through the air and do flips and land perfectly. That's a little different because you can get hurt. And it was reported and she said, Simone said that she had experienced something that I'm not familiar with, but they call it the tizzies. I've actually heard divers talk about this. It's where you lose your place in the air. When you're flying through the air, you have you have spotting marks so that you know where you're at before you land. And she got th she was thrown off in training and it, and it really rattled her. And so she was already not in a good mental space for whatever reason, be it the pressure, whatever the reason was. And then she has something happened in training that legitimately scares her, maybe for her physical safety. That's a legitimate concern that does not exist in swimming because you're not gonna physically injure yourself in swimming because you're not in it mentally. So those are not the same thing. Now, I don't know how much of the tizzies or her losing her place in the air actually was a factor of her pulling out, but that was something that was report reported on. And that's, that's something that I don't fully understand, but it could have been a big factor. And therefore that's a big deal and it's, they're not the same thing. So that's number two. Number three is Simone Biles is a much more established athlete than Caleb leading into the competition. It's a little bit different. Let me explain. Coming off of the Rio Olympics leading into the Tokyo Olympics, Simone was already viewed as basically the greatest gymnast of all time. So we have this insane expectation of her leading into the Olympics. The world has this insane expectation of Simone because of the performances that they have seen at the Olympics. I need to rephrase that. Because of the performances that they have seen from Simone at the Olympics, 
the expectation is there, and therefore all the news media is covering the story. With Caleb, although Caleb is the greatest of the moment, although Caleb won five Olympic medals at the Tokyo Olympics, leading into the world championships, it's already said and done, right? He had just won those medals, so now it's just like, eh. And I, I, maybe you don't agree with that, but the expectation from the public is not the same because he's not as well known. I mean, he won all these medals at the Tokyo Olympics, which was amazing, but he wasn't coming off eight years of being the greatest in the world. I mean, like I said at the top of the show, Simone never lost an all-around competition for basically eight years leading into the Tokyo Olympics. And she had already dominated one Olympics. Before the Tokyo Olympics, Caleb went to Rio and won individual medals, but was by no means the rock star that he is now. And although we, the general swimming audience saw what happened at the 2019 World Championships, saw Caleb win seven medals, saw Caleb break all these world records. The general audience doesn't know about those things. They don't pay as much attention to it. So it's not quite the same thing. So that's the other thing. And the final thing is, is the timing. I don't think these situations were treated the same by the media and by the world because the time has changed. Even though it's only been one year, there's become more of a growing level of acceptance for mental health re issues. That's just that's just like current today. You know, it was a big shock for Simone to pull out of the Olympics and everyone talked about it and everyone wrestled with, was it right or wrong of her to do so? Was she actually capable of doing it? Should she have competed anyway? All those conversations happened and it forced a worldwide conversation that brought up, you know, more of the ha mental health discussion that keeps happening today. And after that happened, it became a little more normalized. Really the last five years, every single year, it's become more and more and more normalized. And some would argue maybe to the point of the detriment of sports. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that is a conversation that is happening. And so with Caleb, when it happened, it's something that we've seen before. We've seen it happen with other elite athletes. We've seen it happen with other NFL players and NBA players with the mental health stuff. So it wasn't such a shock. It was a huge shock when it happened to Simone because it was the buildup of the Olympics at the pinnacle moment when everyone was expecting something from her based on what we had seen, and then it didn't happen. With Caleb, we had already seen all this greatness, and now we're going to, into a competition where far, 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 99% of people don't care about, and it's more normalized. So, you know, it's a very interesting conversation to have, the whole mental health debate with these elite athletes. For me, I just want everyone to be happy, healthy, and doing well, right? I just wish Caleb the best, I wish Simone the best, and I have my thoughts about it, but what do you all think? What do you think about this situation? Is it the same? Were they treated fairly? Was Simone treated unfairly? Was Caleb treated right? You know, where? what do you all think? Let me know in the comment section below because it's definitely something worth discussing. It's definitely worth something, paying attention to how the media, social media, and the general public perceive these kinds of things. It's really fascinating. So let me know down there below. Let's have a conversation about it. And thank you once again to Christopher for asking this question because I do think that it's very, very interesting. Okay, guys. And now with that out of the way, Let's go ahead and move on to topic number four. And topic number four today comes to us from Madrid, from Quebec, Canada. Ooh, right on, Canada again. Uh, Madrid writes, hello, Cody. I hope you are well. I was wondering, what do you think about Summer McIntosh? Do you think she will be the next Michael Phelps? Possibly the Canadian female version. She's already achieved such great things for her age, like going to the Olympics at the age of 14 and being the youngest woman ever to go under four minutes in the 400 freestyle. By the way, keep up the great work. I love the content. All right. Thank you, Madrid, for that question. And yes, Summer McIntosh. Summer McIntosh is a stud. I mean, she is... Her rise is pretty amazing, and it is very, very exciting to see how well she did this past summer at the 2022 Budapest World Championships. She won gold in the 200 fly, she won gold in the 400 medley, silver in the 400 freestyle to Katie Ledecky, and she's already one of the fastest swimmers ever. Your question, can Summer become the next Michael Phelps? Maybe the female Canadian version of it. I don't like 
the comparison to the greatest of all time. I know that this is a common thing that we as fans do, that we as spectators do, is automatically want to compare them to the greatest of all time. I don't think that's a fair comparison. However, she, just to humor you a little bit, she is off on the right start. Michael Phelps made his first Olympic team in 2000, the Sydney Olympics, at age 15. Summer has now made her first Olympics at 14, and she's already one of the best on the planet, so she is on track. So is it possible that Summer could become the next most decorated Olympian of all time? It's possible, because you know, in order, in order to be someone like a Michael Phelps in the category of the greatest of all time of the elites, you have to be good young. And so she's starting off strong. And I'm very excited to see how much faster she can get. That's really the question, right? How much of the gap between her and Katie Ledecky can she can she get? You know, we've already seen her dominate the two fly. We've already seen her dominate the 400 IM. But there is good competition and there are other women in those events that could challenge her. I'm not saying it's it's a runaway train for the next two years leading into Paris. But obviously she is the front runner right now coming off of winning gold this summer. So we will see. I don't think it's ever fair to look at, you know, let me give you an example. I remember when Michael Andrew was on his come up, there was a constant comparison of Michael Andrew to Michael Phelps. Understandably so, because Michael Andrew here in the United States was breaking legitimately every single national age group record. You know, 11, 12 records, all of them, 13, 14 age group records, all of them, 15, 16 age group records, like all of them, anything that was a 200 and below, he was breaking it. And so people were saying, this kid, this kid's the next Phelps. And I don't think that's a fair comparison. I don't like putting expectations that are so high on people. It's okay for us as fans to put expectations on the athletes that we love. That's a part of fandom. That's a part of sports. A part of sports is, having expectations and then speculating about them in a fun way. You know, we're obviously gonna do that. We are gonna talk about Summer McIntosh and other elite athletes as we lead into the 2024 Olympics, duh. However, putting that kind of expectation on someone, I don't think is good for anyone. I don't think it's good for fans because most of the time you're probably gonna be let down because someone like a Michael Phelps is a once in a, more than a once in a generation um, type of athlete. And also it's really not fair to those athletes. Like the comparison of Caleb Dressel to the Michael Phelps, it's going to happen because it's nature and it's what we do in sports, but they're just such different athletes, you know, and, and it, and it's, it disappoints me when I hear someone say something like, you know, he is amazing, but he only won five gold medals. It's like, that's you know how many people have ever won more than one gold medal at Olympics? It's so astronomically rare. And for someone like Summer to be on track to potentially win multiple Olympic medals, maybe multiple Olympic golds at the next Olympics, she is, she already is one of the greats, being this young, this fast. How much better can she get? Can she really etch her way into like the Mount Rushmore of female Olympians, right? Can she get there? I would go ahead and say that the closest thing to you know, in, in the female category, it's probably Natalie Coughlin. Natalie Coughlin, I believe, had 12 Olympic medals. And she won six medals at the 2008 Beijing Games. That gets a little overshadowed because Michael won eight golds, but I believe she won six medals in one games. And even in the Athens Games in 2004, she won four or five medals at that games as well. So, you know, it's more like, can she can she be the next Natalie Coughlin winning that many medals or look at what, what Katie Ledecky has done? I don't know, but uh, you know, the, the, the honest thing is we're all really psyched to see how fast she goes, how much faster can she get? You know, what is her range of events? I mean, 400 IM, 200 Butterfly, 400 Freestyle, what else can she add to her slate? What will her Olympic lineup look like in terms of events? When we get closer to Paris, what will next summer's world championships look? There's a lot here to speculate about. There's a lot here to be excited about. I'm excited to watch her swim, but I don't like those comparisons because whew, all those things. So uh, thank you so much for that question, Madrid. Um, that was a fun one. I appreciate it. And now let's go ahead and move on to topic number five, okay? And topic number five today comes to us from Paul Goldberg. Love that last name. And Paul writes, Cody, 
When will the NCAA join the rest of the world and have the NCAA short course championships done in meters, not yards? To make the US national teams, you must swim meters, not yards. Why will the NCAA not change? Track and field has converted. What is the reason for swimming not changing over? Thanks. All right, Paul, thank you for that question. And yes. Um, okay, to make, as you said in your question, to make the US national team, you must swim meters, not yards. Yes, but it's long course meters. So that's not really relevant. Um, you cannot, you can only qualify for the US national team from a long course meter event because that is the Olympic format. Short course meters is the most common format the rest of the world, but here in the United States, for half of the year, we swim short course yards. And there's, there's really two reasons why this will never happen. But first of all, the comparison to track and field, it's not quite the same thing because track and field converted in the 90s. Track and field switched from yards to the metric system in the 90s and it's a lot easier for them to do that because they're not because because a lot of their events happen on fields and on tracks where they can just change the measurements a little more easily than changing the measurements in a pool so my my two reasons why this will never happen is first of all money second of all availability the majority of the pools here in the United States are short course yards pools. The thousands of pools across the United States, most of them are 25 yard pools because that has been the staple of USA swimming for so long. It's just a form of tradition that has been ingrained in our swimming culture. And because it's so expensive to build new pools and would be ludicrously expensive to try and transition pools to change, it's just not gonna happen. Now, there are a lot of pools that have short course meters options, but that's typically only pools that are 50 meters long that then have a bulkhead. So you have the option to moving the bulkhead there, but the range of pools across America that actually have a short course meter option is very, very low. Like for example, you know, take division one NCAA swimming. Most pools are set up short course yards. That's all there is to it. So there's, there's it's just going to be short course yards. And, you know, quite honestly, the United States kind of loves their yards tradition. I hate saying that tradition is the reason, but tradition is probably next to the financial aspects of it, the biggest reason why people wouldn't want to change. I mean, we kind of love our short course yards swimming. We love comparing it to short course meters, but we love our short course yards swimming. And it's always fun seeing international swimmers come to the United States and see how they fare out with the short course yards format. It is very, very fun to watch. But yeah, that's basically it. It's the availability and it's the money. It's never gonna change. It would be cool to see some more short course meters competitions happen here in the United States. And I actually think that that's going to happen. Um, however, in the NCAA format, probably not. But, but fun fact, I believe in the mid 2000s, the NCAA championships was held short course meters. And that was because USA Swimming was hosting a FINA World Cup or maybe even FINA Short Course World Championships in Larchmont, New York, um, which is a pool that I've actually swam at. And um, yeah, so it has happened before, but as far as changing the format entirely so that everyone swims a certain thing, nope, I mean, it's everything is already set up yards and that's not gonna change for all of the reasons that I just listed. Um, so yeah, hope that that answers your question. Um, yeah, it just, it is, the, it is the way that it is, you know? Thank you so much for the question. Greatly appreciate it. And now let's move on to our final main topic of the day. Topic number six. And topic number six comes to us today from Lin from Shanghai, China. Oh, that's cool. And Lin writes, hello, Cody. I've watched you for years now and I've got to tell you, you're the best. Thank you, Lin. That's so kind. Thanks for being such a great model in our sport. I'm curious to know the genesis of your love for Harry Potter. Obviously, you're a self-proclaimed nerd and very forthcoming about your love for the wizarding world. How did you come to love this franchise so much? What makes it so near and dear to your heart? Thank you for the best part of the day. Cheers. All right, thank you, Lynn, for that question. And yes, as you can see, I am a super Harry Potter nerd. Behind me, I have 180 Harry Potter 
Harry Potter Funko Pops. Um, above that, I have my five-headed Tiamat dragon. Far off to the left, I've got some of my larger Funko Pops. Um, I love Harry Potter. I absolutely love it. Um, fun fact, the second thing that Allie and I ever talked about was Harry Potter. The very first thing, the very first conversation Allie and I ever had was about Lord of the Rings because it was, it was around the time when the Hobbit movies were in theaters. The first Hobbit movie and then the second Hobbit movie. And so we talked about that and then it's spilled into Harry Potter and we both found out that we love Harry Potter. My, my wands are, I don't know if my wands are in frame right now, but I've got all my wands from our trips to the Harry Potter parks. And I love your question. How did I become such a fan? So I'll tell you, when I was around nine or 10 years old, my mom took me to the very first Harry Potter movie. It was the opening weekend of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. She took me to the Sun Coast Resort at, in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I grew up, and we waited in line. Back then you couldn't buy tickets in advance. We waited in line for this highly anticipated movie about this very popular book that I had heard about but I had not yet read. My mom and I watched this movie and I fell in love. I was transported by this amazing magical world. And I walked out of that theater thinking that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. As a young kid, that was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen. And then immediately I was like, mom, we gotta get these books. And so my mom got me the first book and we read it together. And then we read the next book. Um, and then as I grew up, I grew up with that book series. You know, I was one of the kids that waited in line outside Borders Books for the next installment of the series to come out. I remember waiting in line for the Half-Blood Prince for a long time to get that book at Borders Bookstore in Vegas. And, you know, it was a series that I read multiple times over years. And, and in the books, I'm roughly the same age as Harry, the main character. And so I see a lot of the traits, as a lot of people do, from myself in Harry, you know. My father, unfortunately, was not in my life a whole lot, especially as I got older. Um, he had a lot of drug problems and fell out of our life. And my mom worked a lot, a lot to basically keep our house, to put food on the table. And so she was busy. And so there were a lot of times when I felt very alone and um, I resonated a lot with, you know, Harry feeling like an orphan, feeling feeling kind of alone and needing a place to go where he felt safe and felt happy and had and had friends and, and camaraderie and all those things, things that I found at the pool, things that I found on my swim team, but then also things that I found in some of these fictional characters that I loved reading and exploring journeys with them. And as I aged and grew up with these characters, when I dealt with certain things that happened in my life, like my parents getting divorced because of my dad's drug problems. I remember, you know, the only thing that would make me feel better and take my mind off of some of the things that I was dealing with personally was, you know, escapism entertainment. Sometimes I feel like escapism entertainment gets a bad rap. It's, it's really a beautiful thing because it, it allows us to kind of check out, refresh, and come back with a new perspective on things, you know, come back refreshed with, with a feeling of, of happiness, with maybe learning a few things, with just a different perspective on life after, you know, reading about these wonderful stories that, um, that, that relate to real life. Uh, even though they happen in like a, a world with magic. And I, and I love that so much, you know, and when I went through some, some very difficult times, like losing our home, like my parents getting divorced, like, um, you know, quite honestly, not having any money to do anything, you know, fortunately for me, I was good enough at swimming that that paid for my education. But my future beyond high school, I, it was so up in the air. It could have gone so many different ways. And, and that Harry Potter franchise was always there for something for me to look forward to and for something to, for me to invest my time in and enjoy myself and feel comfort and in home and love. And I, and I really, really love that. I really, really do. And that's why I like embrace it so much because I got a lot out of it, right? Like it, it, I saw a lot of myself in some of those characters, but I also was given a sense of relief and um, a new perspective on things from reading, not just the Harry Potter books, but, but a lot of fantasy things. That's why I like, like a lot of fantasy stuff. Um, but I think those things are important. I really, really do. And that's why I still cherish them. And that's why I have them up on my walls. And that's why when Allie and I first dis you know, discovered that we both loved these kinds of things, that was like a big deal. It was a big deal to find someone that loved nerdy stuff. Like a lot of women just, you know, aren't really into that. That's okay, you know, not it's not for everyone, but um, I'm, I got really lucky that, you know, Allie and I, when we first started collecting Harry Potter Pops, 
um, she was like, maybe we should get a few more. Well, maybe she would be, you know, at our, at our old house. It was like, first we got a few as a gift and then we had a big gift card. And so we were like, okay, well, let's just use the gift card and get some more. And then it's like, well, now we've got like 30. There's only like 40. Like, should we get the other 10? You know, it's like, that's like another $150. Uh, do we do this? Like, how much do we love this? And then all of a sudden we had this collection and then it just kept growing. And then it became a thing where Allie and I would, you know, we would wait for the new line of the Harry Potter pops to come out. And when they would come out, you know, we would physically go to the store to go and buy them, even though we could get them online, but it was, it was something fun for us to go and do together. It was, it was something fun for us to go and look forward to doing, to get out of the house, you know, to go to the mall or to go to various nerd stores um, and, uh, and, and buy these kinds of things. And so that is the genesis of my love for this franchise that I hold very, very dearly. It is my favorite franchise. I do love a lot of other amazing franchises as well. Love Star Wars. I love the Lord of the Rings world. I'm liking the new show. You know, all kinds of fantasy stuff I enjoy. But I think that people need to celebrate the things that they love and um, be very open and forthcoming about those kinds of things. That's why it's, it's back there. I let, I let people know, like, you know, you don't have to like it. That's cool. Some of my best friends think that it's dumb. That's fine. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, um, there were times when I was younger where I thought some of the things that I was interested in weren't necessarily cool. Um, fortunately, Harry Potter was very much a part of the zeitgeist and was, was extremely popular. So like, that was a cool thing. But there are other things, some of the more obscure comic booky things that are more popular today, you know, I was into, and um, I always felt like kind of embarrassed to tell people or felt you know, like I should keep things to myself, when in reality, I think you should just celebrate the things that you love. And, and that type of fandom can only become infectious. That type of fandom and love for something can only be a good thing. Because either people feel that same way about it and they get equally excited and they get pumped and they love it, and then you have something to bond over, or people can look at you and say, well, you know, that's not my thing, but I appreciate and love and respect that you have something that makes you this happy. Or on the darker side of things, you have someone that says, oh, that's lame, like that's dumb. But like anyone who looks at someone's passion for something that genuinely brings someone joy and poo-poos on that, I, I don't wanna be associated with that person. I don't wanna be around a person that doesn't at least appreciate someone's passion for their fandom of something. That's my, you know, that's my words of wisdom for you all out there today. So celebrate the things that you love. If I have any advice for anyone, celebrate the things you love. Be unabashed, unabashed, is that a word? Fans of things. And yes, that is, that is how it all started. So uh, thank you so much, Lynn from Shanghai, China for that question. Really, really appreciate it. And um, I hope that you all enjoyed today's show. Um, a lot of great topics today. Once again, if you all have a topic or a question that you want me to answer on the show, a lot of times, you know, I'm focusing on the breaking stories in the swimming world because that's the stuff that really interests me. I'm a fan of the sport. I am a fan of swimming and I want to breathe new life into this world. You know, I've got my swimming vlogs. I'm going to keep making those, keep, keep those coming every single Wednesday. But I like doing other stuff as well, getting people excited about the world of swimming, getting people excited about things that are happening because I love being a fan of this kind of stuff and I love engaging with fans about this kind of stuff. And that's what we do here. That's what the show is. The show is me just being a fan of all of the stuff and giving my two cents, my thoughts, observations, opinions, on those kinds of things. So if you out there have a question, a topic, a subject that you want me to discuss, fire me an email to codymillershow at gmail.com and you could possibly see your question show up here as a main topic on The Cody Miller Show, which airs every single Monday. So guys, thank you all for watching the show. Hopefully it has brightened your day just a little bit. As always, Follow me online. We have merch on the merch store. If you'd like a personalized video from me to you or someone you know, for whatever reason, I am on Cameo. I do have some announcements about virtual coaching, virtual swim lessons, all kinds of cool things coming very, very soon. So stay tuned, just a few weeks, and we're gonna get rocking and rolling with that. But until my next video, I think that's everything. I think I've wrapped this all up. Until my next video, I will see you all later.